I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Here we are in a moldy house, dude. What are we going to do about it? We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. Hot damn. So in five years that I've been doing this podcast, I've never covered mold. I've talked about a lot of things that are, I think we're going to find out related to mold, you know, EMF, Lyme disease, all this kind of stuff that can be related to the mold issue. But I'm super pumped to actually dive in on this niche topic because like EMF, I think it's one of the greatest threats to our health. Totally. And uh, as I had the inspection done in this house, as you know, but just to give the audience some background, uh, we did find some mold. And when we did that inspection, I was like ready to pull the plug. Nope, we're going to back out of the offer. We're done. And then I thought, you know, let me give it a shot. Let me talk to a couple people. And then we got in touch. So I'm yep. super stoked. Turns out it's not as bad as I thought. And it's fixable. It's doable. So I'm going to just dive right in. Um, let's just go into the history of mold and building related illness. When did this start to become at all publicly known as a, as a health issue for people? Yeah. So really in the late eighties and, and early nineties, they started talking and studying mold, uh, the health effects on mold. Um, there was that big case in Cleveland where many infants died. And uh, at that time they had linked it to the stacky botrys that was in the building. They later walked back those claims in 2001, which obviously, you know, is, is very interesting. But um, I would say, you know, 80s and 90s, they really started diving into that, that uh, mold does impact the health. And um, since two, nothing really has changed since that, they walked back to those statements in 2001, uh, except for this, some functional medicine doctors that have really been outspoken and done some amazing things. But from the government, you know, essentially that's 2001, it's like, well, some people are sensitive to mold and that's really it. And uh, based upon what I see every day, I'd say that's far from the truth. Yeah, it's, it's interesting uh, in the times that we find ourselves in that the mantra coming from the powers that be is trust the science. <laughs> but if the science is actually there, we're not supposed to trust it. Anyway, I digress. Uh, what are the different types of mold that we want to look out for that would be in a place we work, hang out, live, et cetera? So toxigenic, allergenic, and pathogenic. Because mold is ubiquitous. It's part of our ecosystem. It does have a form and function outside. It's breaking down dead matter, things like that. You want it to exist. You just don't want it to exist in high quantities inside your home, especially ones that are really more prevalent in water damage, you know, things like pipe breaks, roof leaks, et cetera. Those are going to be some of the more toxigenic, allergenic, or pathogenic molds that can cause you know, neurological symptoms, allergy-like symptoms, maybe the onset of a cold that just never quite goes away, things like that. So since mold has been here presumably uh, far longer than humans and we've been building buildings ever since we figured out how to get out of a cave, I sense that the mold issue has been here forever, right? Sure. Do you think that it's been made worse by the way we build buildings now or have we actually improved the problem? So if you if you go back to, you know, I'm thinking of these amazing castles you see in Europe or something like that. Were the, do you think, were those guys having mold problems or was this something that they sorted out back then? And when we got into the drywall and, you know, lumber building of houses like we do now, that it became a problem. Well, I mean, if you go, you know, travel the world and you go to the, some of these older castles, you'll, you'll notice that it smells musty or that there's mold present. Um, you know, I, I think that we started introducing building materials like drywall and insulation that can hold onto water and moisture for much longer periods than obviously stone wood or cement wood. And I think you're just, you know, you're, you're having that more toxicity. There's chemical reactions in the building materials that take place too, that also impact us. Um, and also, I think that humans were never really developed to live in these enclosed spaces. And especially now the way we build homes, we're building them tighter and tighter. We're taking away ventilation. You know, we were, we were developed to live in caves, right? And uh, live out in the open doors. So we never had this problem. We, our, our health problems started occurring when we started slamming up houses in, in three to six months, um, not paying attention to the way we need to be building them. And uh, you know, people started getting sick and now we're realizing, hey, this is a problem. 
from an architectural and builder standpoint, what are some of the worst corners that are cut and general practices now? I know when we were speaking earlier, you were talking about how a construction crew will bring in a bunch of lumber and just yep. set it right on the wet ground yeah. and then just go, that becomes the studs of your house that is now you know, infested with mold spores, essentially. What are yeah. some things like that that people are doing that's really dumb? So, I mean, I would say that the two biggest problems that I've noticed like right from the get-go are vapor barrier issues. They'll install a vapor barrier incorrectly. There'll be gaps, tears, breaks, rips, etc. What is a, a vapor barrier for those that barely know yes. how to use a hammer? Myself included. <laughs> the top of that list. <laughs> a vapor barrier you put down before you actually pour your foundation. And the point of it is, is to keep the moisture from the dirt from getting into the living space on the floor level, right? So for instance, obviously you have a floor right now where we're sitting on. A moldy one, yeah. Yeah, moldy one, right? Underneath that floor, you have a cement pad, okay? Right. Underneath that cement pad, there's a vapor barrier. Oh, word, really? I didn't know that. Like a sheet of plastic underneath the cement. That, so when you yeah. see the, you know, they, they come and excavate the dirt and, and make it flat here, yep. and then they lay concrete. I always just thought it's just a slab of concrete and you just throw a house on top of it. Yeah. There's a barrier in between the dirt and that concrete. There should be. Okay. That's the way we build houses these days. We, okay. put a, we intentionally put a vapor barrier underneath the concrete. And what that does is that stops the moisture from the earth getting into your house. Right, Because typically on top of that concrete, you have two options. You're going to basically put wood floor laminate, you know, some sort of layered product on top, or you're going to bond directly to it with like a tile. Uh, when you have a layer on top and you have moisture that intrudes in between that layer, it gets trapped. So now you have mold that's growing in between your floor and the cement slab, just, just like right here, right by this door. So let's say that moisture barrier was not done at all or not done right. What harm is it to just have a bunch of mold growing under your floor if you never tear up those floors? Can it just kind of do its thing down there or is it eventually going to find its way into the rest of the house from the floor? It definitely will find its way into the rest of the house from the floor. So every time you open a door or a window, you're changing the building pressurization. So if you're drawing air negatively and that air gets pulled from interstitial cavities like underneath your floor, it's going to get pulled out in the environment. Same thing with the HVAC. You, know, you have these returns, right? These returns are sucking air in to the HVAC. They're conditioning it and it's supplying it back out. So these returns actually draw air negatively and, and you know, are pulling pressure and again, drawing things from interstitial cavities. Interesting. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm going to learn a lot about construction too. Yep. If one was moving into a house or so fortunate to be able to just build a house uh, from the ground up, what are some materials or practices that are better or worse in terms of mold happening later on. Yeah. So we talked about the vapor barrier. The other problem is, is the lumber. I'm not saying that we need to get rid of lumber. I'm just saying we need to be more mindful about using lumber. In the construction process, and I've seen this firsthand in many different cases, even personally, where the lumber gets stuck in the mud for three to four weeks before they even put it up, especially right now with the building boom that we're going through. I mean, people are you know delivering lumber and they're sitting for weeks and weeks before it even goes up. Now, what happens in between those weeks and weeks? It's going to rain, right? The, the ground gets wet. It's going to hold moisture longer than 24 hours. Mold can grow in as quickly as 24 hours. So that's going to be one of the biggest shocking tidbits that people always thought it takes weeks or years or months, right? That's, that's nuts. And pardon the interruption, yeah. but I've always felt when I see a leak, I'm like, yeah, we should probably deal with that in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Like anytime yeah. you see water inside the house, obviously you want to fix it, but it's never been urgent to me. It's like, as long as the leak stopped and it's not continuing, right? Where you're going to get a flood or something like that. But in LA, it, it rarely rains. And when I lived there for all those years, um, there would be times where there was a little leak and I thought, oh, okay, as long as there's no puddle of water, right. we'll just go in there and deal with it. So 24 hours. 24 hours. It can grow in as quickly as 24 to 48 hours. Gnarly. That's the threshold. Do you remember where you were when I just interrupted you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So because mold can grow in as quickly as 24 to 48 hours when it's raining and the lumber is sitting in the mud, what do you think happens, right? We get trapped moisture in between the lumber and mud. Think about it like if you were to take a card, piece of cardboard and you got it wet and then you laid it on top of this floor, right? You're, that trap moisture is going to stay there for a long period of time until you remove the, the piece of cardboard, right? And allow it to air dry. So anytime you have something setting up against something else, you're, you're going to have that potential to trap moisture. So enter lumber on dirt. Guess what also happens to be in dirt? Mold. Right? It's, in, it's in dirt, it's on trees, it's, it's out in the environment. 
So now you're having mold uh, with wet lumber. It's going to grow in as quickly as 24 hours. It's right there. It's a perfect storm for it to start growing. So there it does, right? And as it keeps raining, it just keeps growing and expanding. So mold grows and colonizes. The other crazy tidbit of information is mold is microscopic. By the time you see it, there's already a lot of it there. So that's the other crazy thing. So when I started seeing mold all over lumber and new construction houses, I was like, oh my God, this is a problem. There's actually one case where we tested it. There was 1.5 million spores on a brand new house. So I started thinking, well, what are we going to do about this, right? A, the first step to any change is making it aware so people are aware of it, so that there's a need for change. Now it's, what should we do about this? Well, there's a couple of different things. One, you can get it off the dirt. So get like a platform where it's delivered on and set on top of so that it's elevated 6, 12 inches off the dirt. This way, when it rains, it's not, again, puddled up and then trapping the moisture in between the dirt and the lumber. The second thing, and that should just be standard practice. The second thing I think that needs to happen is when you erect the house, you can treat it and make sure it's fully dry before you start introducing insulation and drywall. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Because I've noticed you'll see a house that has been framed and then they put up the particle board or plywood, then it rains. Yeah. So some people are probably just go ahead and put up sheetrock or drywall like on top of that, right? Or right. siding or whatever right. while it's still wet. And then it's wet. And then guess what? You're putting another piece of material on top of it. It's going to trap the moisture longer. And then it's drywall. So, you know, drywall, it gets wet and it just just becomes mush. That's crazy. So right now there are millions and millions of people around the world living in mold boxes Yeah, for these just mistakes made during the construction process that could be avoided if more people listen to podcasts like this one. Yeah, totally. Speaking of that particle board, whenever I see someone building a house with that, I always think bad move because I think that that particle board is going to be off-gassing much more than your average plywood. Totally. Is that true? Oh yeah, because it's M- it's usually MDF or some sort of pressed you know pressed board or pressed wood, right? Yeah. So all that glue and adhesive in between. I mean, it's usually like flakes of wood just glued together. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you're gonna have off-gassing and VOCs. Do is there any difference in the potential for mold growth between those two with like doing your siding with real plywood versus that particle board? Or the same difference because it has so many different layers to the. The, uh, particle board. I mean, and again, it's it's going to be more semi-porous than the traditional tr- plywood would be. Yeah, you're definitely going to have more potential for trap moisture in between the product. It's going to be stay wet longer and definitely has a, a better potential for mold to grow. Got it. Is there ever a case where your roof leaks or there's a leak under the uh, you know kitchen or bathroom cabinet or something like that, a pipe burst or something? Is there ever a case where that water's present for a couple of few days and mold does not grow? Or is it just an automatic thing whenever there's a water leak that you're going to have mold? Um, You know, it's a great question. Honestly, there is a chance that water is present and mold does not grow. But I would say it's very unlikely considering, again, mold is part of our ecosystem. You are going to have some mold migrate into your environment. What's a really good example of this is if you go and check your toilet lid, I I guarantee you some people are going to do this right now. Sounds gross already. (laughs) (laughs) If you take the toilet lid off your toilet tank and just like flip it over, look at the backside of the toilet tank, but then also look inside the tank itself. If you find mold in there, don't freak out, but you probably have mold somewhere else. And because it's abundant in the air, it's just going to fall where it falls. And your toilet tank happens to be a, a good source of water. So it gives you that idea of like when something is wet for longer than 24 hours, because it's already in our air, it's already in our environment, it has a very high chance that some, a spore or two are going to fall on it, right? It's going to stay wet for a long period of time and has that ability to start growing and colonizing from there. And you know, one spore turns into 100 spores very quickly. I think the thing that is most shocking about this conversation to me is that it's microscopic. Yeah. Because when we looked under a couple of the counters here that in the mold report said, you know, there's water damage here. You want to remediate this area, which thankfully, as you know, we're going to demo the kitchen and all yep. the bathrooms in this house anyway, just because they're horrific looking. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to the sellers, you know, but they're just outdated. 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 That's a more polite outdated. way, less judgmental way to say yeah. that. But no, I mean, it's an older house and whatever. But I saw the report and then I went and looked under the sinks. So I was like, 
I mean, I see where there was water leaks, you know, it's a little discolored and whatnot, but I didn't see any mold. I was like, I don't know. They're being a little too scrutinizing here. Right. And then when I looked under there with you, I'm like, yeah, look in the report, no mold. Or there says there's mold, but there isn't any. And you're like, yeah, that's mold. It's just <laughs> invisible. That to me is, is kind of a, a pisser to be yeah. honest. Cause I think most people that are somewhat mold aware are maybe looking around for it. And if they see it, they'll do something about it. But if they don't see it, they just assume. So based on the fact that there's a, a, a low chance that you could have a water leak and not have mold, it sounds it's much more likely that if you have any kind of water leak, and even if you don't see the mold, it's probably there. I'd say like pretty much maybe 1% of the time, if you have a water stain and you were to actually test it for mold, you would find mold. Wow. I've only seen like maybe one or two shots in my entire career where it was like it came up clean. And that's, you know, that's, I think that for me, that speaks volume just because I, I see a lot of cases every single year. It's just unlikely. And it's not impossible. It's just very, very unlikely because again, these, these materials that we use on top of layers, I mean, even drywall, right? You're going to have your two by four insulation drywall. You have all these building materials that again are touching each other. If you if it gets wet enough, I mean, you're going to have trap moisture. It's just very unlikely. Is there any uh, cutting edge badass stuff you can build with? Is there you know paints that you can use that will not allow mold to happen, or any kind of I don't know, you know, a different kind of drywall that's mold resistant? I mean, is there anything that helps with that, or is it pretty much just anytime you get water present or too much moisture, it's going to find its way? You know, it, it's a good question. There are some products out there that are you know, inhibitors, I would say. So for, for insulation, I love rock wool. It's a mineral wool. It's antimicrobial properties. Um, there's magnesium oxide board, which is like a drywall alternative. I mean, it has its it pluses and minuses just like anything else, but it's water resistant, not waterproof. A lot of people have that misconception that it's waterproof. It's not waterproof, but it is water resistant. They also make moisture resistant drywall now, again, there's a lot of controversy with the chemicals that are needed to create these products and things like that. But it is, again, moisture resistant. It's not waterproof. So if you have a leak and it gets wet and it stays wet for longer than 24 hours, odds are you're going to need to remove it. For me, it. Because, I, because I know what I know, if something gets wet, I'm like, tear it out. It's just not worth it, right? I think the interesting thing about it too, and, and for those listening, we're going to get into the health uh, implications, which is why you would care about it. Other, it's not right. just because mold. Oh, that looks ugly. The wall's a little black. You know, <laughs> I mean, this stuff can kill you. So we're going to get into that a bit. But I think one thing that's fascinating to me that I never knew is that you can have a brand new building that looks beautiful, really high end building, home, office building, whatever, that's full of mold, and no one would ever know. I think that's really weird. And additionally. From what I understand, even in a really dry climate, uh, for example, Arizona, we were just in Sedona, Arizona for a couple months looking for houses before we decided to move to Texas. And a bunch of people there, uh, our friends were like, hey, be careful. You know, when you're buying a place, mold is terrible here. And I was like, what? My skin is about to fall <laughs> off. I'm literally turning into a corpse every day. It's so dry. And they're like, ah, oh, mold's really bad. So is, is that true? I mean, does, does the humidity in the ambient environment matter? Will you have bad mold in a really dry place and you know more so in a more humid um, uh, climate or does it just go everywhere? Well, I think the climate definitely sets the context. Like in Florida where I live, you, you know, it's high humidity pretty much year round. So when you build a house, you have to build with that in mind. You, know, you got to either have really good ventilation that allows this hot, humid air to escape or you have to enclose this space and dehumidify it really thoroughly to make sure that the humidity doesn't get into that 55% danger zone where mold can start to grow inside your home. So I think it depends where you're at. And obviously in Arizona, you have less humidity, right? So what, when it ends up happening when you have less humidity, now you start adding humidity. So now you have these people adding these humidifiers all over their That's house inside their HVAC, right? That's what I did. I, dude, when I would wake up in Sedona in the morning, the windows would be <laughs> frosty. <laughs> I'd yeah. crank that thing, you know? Because it feels good. I mean, humid air feels good right. on your body, sure. right? But now you're like adding all this excess humidity. And now, you know, you start to see signs of mold growing around your windows. And you're like, uh, you're always cleaning it. You're not understanding why. You have mold growing on the grout and around the shower, right? You're 
just kind of like always cleaning mold. You're adding so much humidity because you don't have any in those climates that you're creating your own mold problem inside your own house. Wow. So if you live in a place that is dry and you want to humidify, then you'd have to find a way to humidify where you can actually track what the levels are and keep them in the optimal zone. Likewise, in a place like Florida or here in Texas, uh, or at least in this part of Texas where it's quite humid, you want to get proper ventilation. And I'm assuming keep the interior of the house at a certain humidity level. So A, what's the sweet spot of the perfect humidity where you feel comfortable and healthy, but don't encourage mold? And B, how would one even determine how much humidity is in your house? Yes, I think the sweet spot is probably that 40 to 45% range. You know, when you 55% and up, you really start to get in that danger zone. And, you know, outside of buying hygrometers, which would be the the tools that we would use professionally. Sounds too complex already. (laughs) Yeah. You you know, getting humidistats. I mean, a lot of a lot of the new thermostats have the humidity reading inside the house as well. Oh, okay. So you start there. But you can add if if you have a larger home and you're you want to kind of cover more ground. You can buy standalone humidistats and put them around different places that kind of tell you the humidity in that area. They're not 100% accurate, but they give you a good, a good uh, range and idea. You can tell if you're at 90%. You, at least, yeah. and you need to do well, something about that. You should be able that. to tell that just by being in the space. You right. Know, but, you're like sticky as hell from yeah. doing nothing. <laughs> That's what I hear about the summers here. Everyone's like, man, you don't want to be here in the summer. I go, what? Who cares about sun? Give me sun. Yeah. I go, no, you'll see. <laughs> Hopefully I don't. Hopefully I love it. Uh, interesting thing that I've heard over the years in terms of um, the relationship between EMF, which is something I talk about all the time, and mold is that mold tends to proliferate uh, faster in a high EMF environment. Is there any truth to that? And if so, why? Yeah. So there's there's been some studies that definitely show that EMFs will actually the radioactivity right causes mold growth to actually speed up. Uh, mold. What's interesting is again, it's it's an alive organism, right? Microorganism, and uh, when it feels threatened, it definitely just like any other organism out there, it it's trying to reproduce as quickly as possible. At the same time, certain species of mold produce what's called mycotoxins, which are a fungal toxin produced by certain species of mold. Then you know the word toxin meaning toxic, so it can cause harm to humans, animals, etc. And when, again, we don't really know what makes it feel threatened, but for whatever reason, I guess the frequencies of EMFs make mold feel threatened. Uh, when, I, when I start to think about that, I'm thinking, well, it kind of makes sense, right? Because if humans can get adversely affected by EMFs, why wouldn't mold, that's a tiny microscopic organism, not be affected by EMFs? The difference might be is when a human being is under threat, they don't typically go, um, how do I say this? Um, spread their seed everywhere. <laughs> if I'm if I'm really uh, afraid for my life, the last thing I'm looking for is sex. So I think it's interesting. Mold is, it's this living organism. It has its own innate intelligence, right? So when it gets threatened by EMF or maybe remediation, you know, things, you're tearing out a cabinet, the mold gets pissed and just starts jizzing everywhere, basically. Essentially, yeah. I mean, you know, I guess humans, if you're threatened, you, your fight or flight kind of kicks on, right? And you're you're looking to either flee and or fight and stay, but I think at some point, you know, instinctively we have that intuition of reproduction, right? We just we don't know why, but it's just kind of our instinct, right? So the mold is just going, okay, we're under threat. We need to make sure that we stick around, and so let's start putting these spores out everywhere. Yeah. How? This is maybe technical, but I'm curious. Okay, this mold is microscopic. And then when it gets agitated and is fighting for survival and wants to spread, it sprays out spores, which are also microscopic. So all this is going on and we have no idea at all. Yeah. And if you see the mold, like what we saw in the garage, that's the nastiest spot under the stairs. Totally. Like that's legit black mold. I mean, even I would know like, holy shit, don't (laughs) stick your head in there. But in that case, say I get in there... Um, you know, with a broom and I like start sweeping, thinking I'm sweeping that black mold off and I kind of get rid of it and, and I think it's clean. What have I just done? Oh, you're going to get it aerosolized. Yeah. You're, you're going to obviously agitate it. It's going to become aerosolized and it's going to just get all over the garage. It's not, it's not something I would recommend doing. So it's 
it's not it's not just bad because I'm going to be breathing it right there. It's bad because now it's literally going to fill up the whole garage with spores and yeah. just be everywhere in the air and then settle on things in there. Totally. And so say say I did the, I mean obviously we're talking hypothetically here. I would hopefully never be this dumb, but I'm sure I have been at some point (laughs) in the past. Let's say I go down there. I'm like, I'll just fix this myself. I'm not paying 10 grand for mediation or whatever. So all our stuff stored in the garage. So if I stirred up that mold and then maybe I painted over it with kills mold killer, I spray bleach on it or whatever, and we put new drywall there. And then I move all that stuff from the garage into the house. It's now been infested, I guess you could say, with spores that I just stirred up. Is that going to encourage mold growth inside the house or is that just going to be a health risk because the couch that's in the garage now is covered with spores and then the dog and cat and we all breathe it because we're sitting on the couch where the spores were. How do, like how does it spread and then get in us to the point where we're going to have health problems? All right, so we got a there's a lot that happened in that in that uh, scenario here. We got to break uh, this down. This is my Flintstonian breakdown of something very <laughs> complex. So now is your turn. I pass you the ball. Break down the complexity right, so uh, for us. We're going to talk about first I highly recommend not putting bleach or, or painting over mold with kills or any mold killer or anything out there that's supposed to be this magical solution. Why? Three reasons why. Okay. One, there's an opportunity. There's a moisture or water intrusion that created the opportunity for mold to grow in the first place. None of that which solves that problem. And so Noted. it'll just keep coming back, right? Noted. Uh, the second thing is, you know, you're not... Even the CDC, and this is something that I actually agree with for once... Is they don't they don't want you to kill mold, they actually want you to remove it. So I look at mold as I look at a weed. It's actually really similar. You know, weeds produce seeds, mold produces spores. Weeds have roots that grow into you know the soil. Mold has roots called hyphae that grow into building materials. And so when you look at that and that simple analogy, now you say, do you want to actually remove mold fully by ripping its roots out, or do you want to just chop? chop the stem off and you know, kind of hope it doesn't come back. We know that with weeds, if you just chop the stem off, it's just going to come back. Same thing with mold. That exact scenario is exactly how it happens. And so when you're just pouring bleach on it, yeah, you may, you may help get rid of some stuff on the surface, painting over it again. You're really covering it, just going to grow right through the paint eventually. But that's kind of that, how we want to we wanna actually remove it in that scenario. First, the, the second part about this whole scenario is, is kind of what happens with the contamination. So you have mold growing in there. It's getting aerosolized. It's settling on stuff. When you agitate it in that exact scenario, let's say it has 10 spores per cubic meter getting into the air right now. It could be tens, hundreds, maybe even millions getting into the air at that point because you're, you're really agitating it. It's going to be you know, kind of activating a lot quicker. Um, now, it's, now you have a lot more volume per cubic meter that's going to be settling on your stuff and that's stored inside the garage right now. Then you're going to be picking that up, bringing it into your house. So you could be potentially bringing millions of spores in. And like when you do a test, usually like an air quality test, it typically have like 100 or 200 mold spores outside and you have 100 or 200 inside. I mean, millions bringing inside is not a great idea as you can imagine in that that quick uh, synopsis. Now it's going to be getting into your into your stuff, which obviously could get into your breathing zone. It's on your couch. You sit down on your couch, right? A dust cloud of mold pops up essentially if you can visualize that. It's going to get in your breathing zone. It's going to enter the body. Also, we have HVAC concerns. So now it's, again, it's in your environment. The AC kicks on. The AC is sucking air up, right? Some of that air is going to have mold in it. Again, it's going to now get into the coil. The coil constantly condensates. So what that means is the coil is pretty much always wet. Perfect environment for mold to grow. So your mold that was just on your couch gets aerosolized, gets into the HVAC system. The HVAC system now becomes a mold factory. And here we are. Brutal. Yeah. Is there any difference between um, temperatures? So like if you got those spores in your HVAC system... Is it going to grow faster if you're blowing heat than AC or vice versa? Does it matter? Or even just in the climate that you live? I mean, I mentioned Arizona, it's hot as hell and they have tons of mold. 
does that matter or is it all really about the moisture? It's really about moisture and humidity. It's not, it's not so much about temperature. But the, the key with temperature is, again, people don't realize temperature differentials create condensation. So if it's super cold outside, super hot inside, and you don't have good insulation, you can have condensation developing. I'm sure people have seen this all the time, like where it's really warm inside and really cold outside and there's like a, you know, like a frost developing on the window, right? Mm-hmm, and that's mm-hmm. that moisture basically condensating. Um, that can create, again, a wet environment, especially if that condensation gets into your wall cavities. Now you have wet walls, right? These are all problems to consider when, when actually looking at temperatures. It's really the temperature differentials. Interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm thinking about also um, that frost on the windows goes the other way too, right? Yep. So um, that's wild, man. Okay. Uh, let me see. Where do I want to go with this? Okay. So testing. Uh, you could walk through your house and just visually check. We determined that that's going to suck because it's microscopic and it's invisible in many cases, but still could have harmful uh, effects on your health. So part of the thing that I did when I moved in here was get that mold inspection, hired a what I thought was a pretty fancy company. Um, that I knew something. I knew that they... I wanted a place that did like swab tests, not just testing the air inside right. and outside. I mean, I kind of had that together, <laughs> um, but it was pretty expensive. I think it was like a couple grand to get the inspection. And uh, they did all kinds of different samples and then apparently sent them back to a lab. And then I got the report, which said, these are the types of mold that we found. Uh, these are the areas that they were with photos and all of that stuff. But I'm guessing based on my limited experience that there could be a huge differential between how one testing company does it and another. So totally. when people are shopping around, like hearing this going, oh shit, I better check my house for mold or I'm building or just about to buy or rent or whatever. Um, what do people want to look for in terms of having their home inspected? Because we definitely can't rely on ourselves to do it. Now, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, as you know, there's a massive disparity just between this industry and, and pe- professionals in it, like period. Um, a mold inspection should look a lot like a home inspection when you're buying a house. I think if you've ever been in that position, a guy's in there for like four or five hours looking at every nook and cranny of that house. The mold inspection should be done the same way. It shouldn't just be this guy who comes in for 15 minutes, takes one air sample in the middle of the house and goes, yep, you're all good here. Because you're going to get this false sense of security thinking the house is perfect only to move in and find potential problems later after you've already closed. That's the, anyone's worst nightmare. And uh, a lot, uh, I wouldn't say a lot of our clients, but I've dealt with a lot of people that have been in that predicament. And it's, it's really disheartening to kind of shell out every dollar you have on buying a house and then boom, you, can't, uh, you don't really even have the funds to remediate. So I would say definitely make sure you hire a good inspector, someone that's going to be there for hours, really looking out for your best interest. And they should do an array of testing. Um, do I think that air is completely obsolete? No, if you know how to do it right. Um, I think it it could be useful, but it's doing it right does not mean you're doing it in the middle of a room. Um, swab testing is important too. If you see like a water damage stain, kind of like what we saw under your kitchen sink, again, the naked eye, you would think, ah, it's just a little bit of water damage, right? Swabbing that area to see if it is a problem is a good idea. But there's also different types of testing that's a little bit more on the progressive side, kind of more into the realm of where we need to go as a culture. And that's uh, MSQPCR testing, which is uh, a, a big, big name brand, if you will, is called ERMI, which was developed by the EPA. Um, Hurts me. Um, there's EMA. There's a couple different variations, but MSQPCR is a technology that it's developed off of. And it's more accurate than the, the other PCR test, I'm hoping? Yeah. <laughs> well, what it does... <laughs> Couldn't resist. Yeah. What it does, it basically gives you like the, the DNA of what's there. So if you have, let's say, five spores of stachybotrys in your environment and 100 spores of cladosporium, it's going to tell you that. And so what it does is actually t- test the dust. The limitations of it obviously are... We don't know if that cladosporum was from 10 years ago or if it was from yesterday. So it tells you how contaminated the space is, which is good data to have, but it doesn't tell you where, the, where it came from. So you have to do that in conjunction with actual source testing, as I call it, which is kind of the testing required to identify where the problem areas are that need to be remediated. There, you also can test for mycotoxins, which is another, you know, again, it's produced by mold. 
especially if you're someone who's immunocompromised, I think it's really good to understand because you could actually do similar testing to on the medical side to see if, if it's in your body as well. So if, you, if it correlates with your house, odds are you know that your house is causing adverse health reactions. Oh, so you can actually get your body tested for, you can. for mycotoxins? You can. So you've got, you've got the mold itself. You've got the mold spores, like it's seeds essentially. Mm-hmm. And then is the mycotoxin the waste matter of, uh, of the mold? Or what, like what, why do they produce mycotoxins? So it's just a self-defense mechanism. For whatever reason, it feels threatened. It could be EMFs. Um, maybe you had you know, a remediation done, but they didn't fully remove everything. And throughout that remediation, mold produced mycotoxins. Um, maybe mold uh, started to dry out and got brittle. And again, as a self-defense mechanism, it starts producing toxins. Oh, okay. It, you know, there's a lot of different ways that mycotoxins can be produced and only certain species produce it. It's a good idea to test for it in that regard, so you can understand if it's that's that's something that you have to deal with. Because there's a whole you know a whole thing to do with dealing with that. And you're talking about fabric; you have to you know get rid of fabric because in most cases you're not going to be able to remove mycotoxins from it. Mycotoxins kind of act as a chemical residue. If you look under a microscope, it, it kind of looks like black tar. It's like a sticky residue. Oh, interesting. So if you think about that. It's, going to be kind of hard to get rid of that from fabric that so this, soaks it up like a sponge. So this is what you hear about if someone has mold infestation and they have to get rid of all their furniture, all their clothes, all their rugs. Like they literally just have to dump every single thing in their entire house and just yeah. trash it. Yeah. That's, that's typically one of the protocols. If you have mycotoxins, you're, you're very minimalist at that point to make sure you get rid of everything. But not necessarily with other types of mold that don't produce mycotoxins. You could get away with remediation and salvage your personal belongings and stuff. You, you definitely have a better chance of success with that. You know, think about like looking at this couch, for instance, right? Mold spores, as we know, they're microscopic. I, if they get embedded into these fibers, I mean, even with a vacuum, you may not fully get rid of every mold spore that could potentially be here. So you're going you're gonna to want to really understand a range of sensitivity. Every individual is going to be different. So if you know you're really reactive to mold, you're going to want to err on the side of caution as much as possible. At that point, you're making lifestyle changes, right? You're going to go with leather products as opposed to fabric. Uh, you're going to have as minimal carpeting as possible. Um, and you're really going to kind of like live that, with that in mind. Anything that you can clean, anything that's like non-porous that can be cleaned and disinfected properly, you're going to want to kind of lean more towards that direction um, when you're buying furniture and things like that to kind of live that that minimalist lifestyle. Wow, that's interesting. And how does one even... And I've known so many people that have mysterious health problems and they go down the rabbit hole of being misdiagnosed and trying all these different lifestyle changes and supplements and things like that. And then eventually way, way, way down the road, find out that they were exposed to mold and also that they happen to be particularly um, um, sensitive to it. So how does one, you know, like with a functional medicine doctor or something like that, how does one even test if they've been exposed to mold and if they are, if they would be considered sensitive or just a normal person? The only way to really know if you're sensitive is to really find out if you're sensitive, you know, unfortunately it's kind of, usually you find out the hard way. So based on symptoms? Based on symptoms, you know, like if you're, once you identify that mold's a problem and you know, you get rid of mold and you move out of that environment, because typically when you're doing a remediation, you're walking away from your home while it's being remediated. You're going into a safe space where you can heal. And usually you're, you're meeting with someone like a functional medicine doctor to put you on some sort of program to help detoxify. Now, there's certain people that have this, this uh, HLA-DR gene where they literally just cannot methylate and detoxify properly at all. And so they just get this constant buildup of toxins from being in a toxic environment that they're not able to detoxify. So they absolutely have no, like, no choice but to vacate, you know, perform remediation. And while they're in a healthy space, definitely detoxify with, with some sort of program. Because for, for those types of individuals, I mean most people can detoxify. And even someone who's sensitive, you're, you're detoxifying maybe slower than the average person who's not impacted. But there is a subset of the population that just can't detoxify at all. And that's really where you know, it becomes a, a major, major problem. So if someone's starting to have autoimmune type symptoms or just mysterious stuff, is, are there standardized tests that doctors use, functional medicine doctors, et cetera, that can say, yeah, you got mycotoxins in your blood or 
we found mold on your skin or, you know, how do they even know if that's what it is that seems to be troubling you? Well, it has to be a doctor that's kind of mold literate that knows okay. to test for mycotoxins. Because if you go to a doctor, you know, and you, you just say, I'm not feeling well, odds are the doctor is going to be like, okay, well, uh, you know, are you depressed or do you have anxiety? <laughs> you know, it's like the first like go-to thing, right? When they right. can't figure out what's wrong with you, they just immediately think like, oh, this must be like a psychological thing. You know, for me, I speak to these people every single day, right? And so I know it's not psychological. I know that this is real. You know, they're really having these impacts. And it's a shame that they have to sometimes go through six or seven doctors to finally find someone that can help them. And that's what's really disheartening about like kind of the state that we're in. I look at it as like when we smoke cigarettes, it took us like 50 years for like, yeah, cigarettes are bad. We're going to stop smoking cigarettes. You know, we're kind of like in year 20 of this whole 50 year cycle, if you will, with mold. And so, yeah, we're, we're definitely more aware than we've ever been. But at the same time, if you can go to a, a doctor and have mold like symptoms and you're, you're complaining about things and they're trying all these batteries of tests to figure out what it is and everything's coming up like, I don't know what's wrong with you. Like, wouldn't you check, you know, mold? I mean, think about it. The average person takes 20,000 breaths per day. That's 20,000 potential you know, uh, times where you can have contamination enter the body. I mean, we consume air more than we consume anything else every single day, but we never look at air. There's an interesting correlation between EMF that comes to mind in that when you look back on doctor, we were talking about this earlier, doctors smoking cigarettes, building yeah. buildings with asbestos. I mean, on and on and on, spraying DDT on little kids so they don't... <laughs> flies don't land on whatever, right? As we look back and we're like, oh my God, humans were such idiots. I can't believe they did X, Y, and Z. I always think about EMF that same way when I'm driving around and I see a cell tower next to somebody's bedroom and I just go, oh my God, in a hundred years or whenever it is, hopefully sooner than that, we're going to look back and go, wow, how could we have been so dumb? But I think with the EMF issue it's a bit tougher and perhaps slower than mold because you have an entire industry, the telecommunication industry, right? And military for that matter, that depends on wireless communications, right? And we've all become accustomed to it, but there's such a monetary incentive to suppress information, public knowledge around EMF, right? If I own a gas station and you're AT&T and you want to come put a cell tower on my roof, I might not think it's a great idea, but if you're going to pay me a couple grand a month to put it there, eh, okay, right. right? So there's like so many people getting paid. Whereas with, so anyone that speaks out against it is going to be labeled a 5G conspiracy theorist or whatever. Um, there's going to be a lot of pushback from getting that out and incentive from the people that are behind it to hide the things they know, like the tobacco industry famously, right? But with mold... It doesn't seem like there's anyone really to benefit from suppressing the information publicly about the health risks. Do you think that it's going to become more ubiquitous uh, in terms of public awareness? Or are there hidden players behind the scenes that don't want us to know about mold because they're making money from hiding it? Uh, Good question. Um, I think insurance companies definitely stand to lose if mold is, uh, you know, more, if there's more awareness surrounding mold. I remember I asked you earlier, hey, did you uh, check your insurance policy and see uh, what your mold coverage is? <laughs> totally. You're like, I have no idea. Odds are when you bought your, when you bought your house, you, got, you, you called your broker, probably was a good recommendation. You call this guy like, hey, let me get some, some home insurance. He's like, no problem. And you're like, it's all done. You know, they probably ask you some questions like, you know, what year was the house built and, you know, what kind of, what's your attic made, what's your roof material made out of? But like very simple, basic questions. Did they once ask you, how much mold coverage do you want? No, not at all. It wasn't even in the conversation, which is why I was nervous because, well, I guess I'm getting rid of it at the, at the outset, but right. I was nervous, uh, you know, once I found that out. But yeah, I don't even know if it's in my policy. I have to look. I mean, I don't know the laws in Texas off yeah. the top of my head, but it, it may not even be in your policy at all where you need to like call and add an addendum right. to your, your policy to get it. But, but typically, like most states have like a $10,000 like minimum. And that's just kind of what, when you call and get it, because you, no one specifically asked for more, they just throw you in at 10,000. You actually, you've had some quotes on remediation, you know, yeah, before the we remediation sat down. quote was bizarre because they're like, 
it'll be between f- at least f- 15,000, but it could be as high as 30. I'm like, that's a pretty widespread. <laughs> yeah. like, so it's either half or full, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was just like, uh, okay, we got to figure something out that's a bit more specific. But, you know, to their credit, um, I didn't have the actual protocol from the inspection. I just had the findings of the inspection. So right. they said they could narrow it down. But I was like, yo, we're starting at $15,000. Homie wants to buy some furniture in yeah. this place, you know? Not trying to like clean under the kitchen sink for $15,000. <laughs> I want to do right. something fun. But yeah, it was shocking. So, so more than 10. Yeah. So say, right. So say I already lived here and then discovered that I had mold because my health went awry or something like that. I'm now bummed. Say it does go up to $30,000 and my insurance only covers 10. I'm out of pocket for $20,000 plus any loss of livelihood or well being that right. has so ensued from the damage caused by the mold physically. Typically, yeah. And typically, a lot of these doctors that you have to go to for treatments, the insurance companies don't want to cover those treatments. Yeah. All, so most of the good doctors aren't yeah. covered. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a sham in that regard. Now insurance companies, again, we all become aware. We start calling all these companies and saying, No, no, give me like a hundred thousand dollars worth of coverage. And they're like, Oh, it's only fourteen dollars more a month. Okay. Yeah, I'll have that, believe me. You know, th- that's when things start changing and they start losing money on these claims. The only reason that they're winning right now is because anything that happens, they know they're really only tied to ten grand. And so times that by how many millions of people and you're really seeing how much they're mitigating losses by putting these, these kind of chokeholds on you and you don't, you're not even aware of it. But thankfully, uh, I mean, I guess it depends how high up the pyramid you go, but the insurance industry uh, by and large is not in control of the media industry. Sure. Whereas the telecommunications companies are often tied in, if not direct owners of um, a TV network or something like that, right? So getting damaging information out about EMF exposure and the telecommunications infrastructure is going to be much harder and, and, and fought against with uh, much more um, determination than the insurance companies trying to hide the mold issue from people. So basically what they're doing is just let's keep the maximum low so that if people do have claims, at least we're not going to have to pay the whole thing. If your right. remediation is $30,000, and they only have to pay 10. But luckily they're not like censoring the internet, like making sure people don't find out about mold and, and, and whatnot, right? Yeah, I don't think that there's that much. I mean, uh, we know that there's some lobbying going on. We know that you know CDC has walked back some claims in 2001 um, based upon studies they did in the 80s and 90s that said, Hey, mold is uh, not great for our health, and now all of a sudden it's um, and it hasn't changed since two thousand and one. It's still right on the CDC website. Basically, well, mold can you know some people can be allergic to mold, and so the, for those people it could could be uh, cause some concern. Wow! So God, I, up the, until this moment, I trusted the CDC implicitly. That's shocking. You know, the power of lobbying, of course. Right. So insurance companies lobby CDC to kind of put the kibosh on the the harshness of the uh, of the situation. Yeah, I mean it's it's public record. You can see which companies are donating to, you know, which uh, platforms and um, it's it's all it's all right there. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. You would never think why would insurance companies want to lobby politicians? You would never think that they would, but <laughs> they're giving millions away to them, so. Oh man, I love having a podcast. <laughs> you know, I always like count my count my blessings cuz you never know when a, you know someone like me could be disappeared from the internet for talking about <laughs> forbidden topics. Um, hopefully mold is still somewhat safe. Um, let's talk about some of the health issues. So, you know, someone's listening to this show and they're like, well, I feel great. Who cares? Like, I'm not worried about it. And I don't want people to worry, but I want people to hopefully have some awareness around this. You know, maybe one of your relatives is ill and they can't figure it out and they've never even heard of mold. They think it's something that happens on your bread and that's it. And someone listening might be able to go, oh, those symptoms sound familiar. So what are some of the uh, the things that mold do to you, some of the symptoms or even some of the co-infections, how it relates to Lyme or autoimmune or things down the road that someone could uh, unfortunately have happen if they do get acute and long-term exposure. Yes. I think if if I were to survey my clients, I'd say probably the number one um, response I would get would be brain fog. I think that's kind of one of the, the clear... Um, 
symptoms that everyone seems to kind of correlate with. You have brain fog and other cognitive difficulties. Um, I've talked to clients that have like severe slurred speech when they're, you know, in that environment. And they're, you know, unfortunately, when you're going through remediation, even though you know it's like, hey, you need to just like walk away, you know, and 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 let the professionals do it. You have this like sense of urgency to protect your stuff, right? And you you keep going in there for your favorite flip flops and you you just keep you can't stay away. <laughs> and it's like I've seen people really just get debilitated with that. And um there was one client in particular, I mean, like when you talk to her, she had, I mean, just just standard American accent. And then when you talk to her when she was like really going through a fit, she actually like had like almost like a Japanese accent. It was the strangest thing. And that's when I knew. And I would ask her, did you go to the house today? And she's like, yes. I'm like, you, you got you to gotta stay away. Uh, I've seen some really, really strange things. The other, the other thing that's pretty common is like skin rashes, like unexplainable, like skin issues, rashes, hives, things like that. Um, Allergy-like symptoms where you literally just, you know, I personally think seasonal allergies don't exist. I think it's, it's in the environment that's impacting our bodies. Really? You know, it happens when pollen, you know, pollen's in mm-hmm. season, right? We have all that particulate that's entering our body. Um, if you go on American Lung Association, CDC, EPA, they all talk about particulate matter and pollution and climate change and all these other things. When you look at particulate matter, anything smaller than 10 micrometers, which mold happens to be, by the way, that, that gets into the body, it literally passes right through the respiratory tract and enters the bloodstream, which is, it says right on there, on all three websites, that's the biggest health risk is smaller particulate that can pass right through into the bloodstream. Mold happens to be that. So if, if we're going back to saying, well, mold's really not that big of a deal, then based upon the particulate size, it is, right? So again, when you have allergies, my, my professional opinion, I think that you're having you know, these times where there's higher counts of particulate matter, whether it's indoors or outdoors, that's getting into the body and causing you these allergy-like symptoms. So if people talk about seasonal allergies, they're always like, yeah, it's in the summer, you know, in the winter, right? And I'm always like, oh yeah, so you mean when you switch to air conditioning from heating and when you switch from heating to air conditioning? Oh, right? snap. So it's like, as you're switching gears, again, you're, when you're passing through the coil and the AC in the summer, especially when you're in a climate like the Northeast, um, or I guess the North really in general, you have the coil that's constantly condensating in the summertime. And then it basically just like slowly but surely dries out. And then you switch to heat. And now it's again, it's pumping right through and again, circulating that air again. Yeah, it's, it's just giving, it's just basically you're having periods of rest and then unrest with all this particulate matter entering the body. So that's kind of how, uh, that's my professional opinion um, on what I think seasonal allergies really is. I think it has to do with the particulate matter. That's very interesting. I've never heard that. I like it when I do a show and I hear a lot of things I've never heard. We're up to probably a hundred things so far <laughs> that I'm like, oh shit, I thought I knew some stuff. <laughs> wow, that's wild. Yeah, I'm not someone who um, that I'm aware of has suffered from allergies. But one thing I have noticed is traveling sometimes. If I walk into a hotel room and it smells kind of musty, mm-hmm. if I'm there a few days, my joints will start killing me. I'll start having like weight. I mean, I always have back pain, unfortunately, but... It'll get a lot worse. My elbows will start hurting, just weird stuff. And I've always thought, I bet those rooms are moldy because after a few years of awareness of that, um, it's like I don't want to psychosomatically create sore joints because I smell must. So it's hard, you know, with the nocebo yeah. effect. But is there a correlation there uh, with mold exposure and yeah. like body pains and aches and things? Yeah, muscle cramps, joint pains, body aches, all that. I mean, you can get fever and chills and things like that from mold. Um, and then you have, you know, the array of uh, mycotoxin exposure symptoms as well. I mean, there's certain mycotoxins that are known to be carcinogenic, cancer causing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to jump down rabbit holes, but I've definitely seen some interesting studies correlating between cancer, um, you know, l- not just lung cancer either, because you would think lung cancer, respiratory, right? But skin cancer and other cancers correlated with mold exposure due to the fact that there was mycotoxins present. Oh, wow. So the mold's bad, but it's definitely like a double whammy if you got the mic, if the type of mold that produces mycotoxins. Yeah. You're totally screwed. On the note of mycotoxins, um, 
<laughs> what what do you think about the um the idea that much of the world's coffee supply has mycotoxins. I mean, when Dave Asprey yeah. came out with Bulletproof Coffee, I got so paranoid. I wouldn't drink any other coffee. And then a few other companies came along that yeah. said, we also test for mycotoxins. Um, so do you think that's as big of a deal as it's made out to be? Or is it just a great way to sell a lot of coffee? No, I think it's, I think it's actually awesome. I mean, when, when, when Dave Asprey came out with Bulletproof Coffee, you don't understand like, the, the level of excitement that I had. You, first, did you know about that issue already? Y- you know what? I, I didn't, or you just knew about mycotoxins? I knew about mycotoxins, right? I didn't know specifically that coffee was an issue. And then obviously it was kind of one of those things where it was like, as he first uttered those words, I'm like, well, duh, they get stored in like dark, humid contain, you know, containers, right? Um, I was just like, wow, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I drink coffee all the time. And I literally remove mycotoxins from people's homes. Why am I not drinking this coffee right now? You know, yeah. and it was just like it was one of those things. Where, I mean, I love the guy for creating this awareness of mycotoxins. It's in coffee. I'm, I'm trying to create that same awareness of it being in your home, right. impacting you on a higher level than you know how many cups a day of coffee you drink. Um, but you know, it's it's just cool to have that awareness. You know, that that popped up at a time where I'm you know really research, researching and developing techniques to remove things from people's homes. Cool. Yeah. He also did a, a documentary um, some years ago called Moldy. I don't yeah. know if you ever saw yeah. that. Yeah. And it's it's funny because he already had a pretty big name at that point, but I didn't really hear much. I mean, it, it wasn't an amazing documentary or something. It was just, you know, it gives you kind of yeah. enough information to go, oh, I should pay attention to that. But I kind of thought, I remember at the time that that would have gotten more traction and been like a a bigger splash in the health community at least, but it kind of was talked about and then just sort of faded away. But um, in this conversation with you, I'm realizing this is even way more serious than I thought, even before we had this conversation. I'm like, holy shit, especially the microscopic thing. Because that, to me, it's just like if I smell mold, then I get a little nervous. If I see it, I definitely don't go near it. But I would never go into a place and just think, oh, there's probably mold in here that I can't see. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty tricky, this one. It's kind of like COVID, right? You can't see it. So it's like, <laughs> it's just like you know, silent, deadly killer that just makes people, you know, lose their mind over it. And mold is really, it's, it's no different in that, in that regard where it's silent, you don't see it. And by the time you see it, it's already way too late. Right. And so I think it's, it's one of those things where a lot of people are just like, eh, I don't really believe in it. I can see it. You know, when I see it, I just kind of paint over it or, you know, we've been throwing bleach on it forever. So why not still throw bleach on it, even though it's been debunked that it's not not an effective method. Hey, in terms of size, I don't know if you happen to know this, but um, with, a, with a mycotoxin or a mold spore or some sort of um, toxin from mold, in terms of size, would it be larger or smaller than a virus? Well, the virus is going to be the smallest. Okay. So you're going to have virus, bacteria, mold, allergens, toxins, et cetera. Okay. And do the masks that we find people wearing, these little blue um, formaldehyde sprayed toxic blue masks that cut off your oxygen supply, um, would those help you at all if you had to deal with mold inside the house? Like say you just found a little bit in your shower and you wanted to scrub it off or something. I mean, would it do you any good to put on a little mask if you're around mold or does it just go right through it like a virus does? Not at all. I mean, you could smell mold through the, through one of those masks. Oh, yeah, so they're just not. pointless. So like, <laughs> so when we, when we work, we have to wear like an N95 respirator, mm-hmm. which, which is actually proven to stop, you know, 0.01 uh, micrometers in size, which is just a touch below what a mold spore would be. The yeah, virus would be much smaller than that, and so it would pass through a mask theoretically easier than a mold spore, even. Well, because the virus is much smaller, yeah. so yeah, in theory, it passes through. The only um, the only science behind like wearing masks and the prevention is the the actual liquid particles. Like if you sneeze, right? You know, you're gonna have these liquid particles that get aerosolized. Those liquid particles are gonna be larger, and the mask will stop that. Interesting point. So it's, it will stop some. Virus right. particles, because you're going to have, I don't know, I think there, there's, I think it's a thousand virus particles or something like that inside one droplet. So yeah, you're going to stop some virus particles, but you're not stopping it completely. Okay. Total, a little off topic there. Yeah. I just could, I'm a smart ass. I couldn't help throwing, <laughs> <laughs> throwing that in there. <laughs> People that listen to this show will understand why. 
Yeah. Um, okay, so we've discovered what causes it, building practices, uh, the types of things that need to be done in order to test for it, some of the health implications. Um, I guess I'd like to talk about some of the remediation practices. So if you find you know, someone to come do an inspection on your home, great. But then you find the mold, what do you do about it? How do we get it out? Which is what I'm about to undergo here. The first thing is getting the testing done. And you know, testing obviously can vary in, in terms of expense. You said you paid a couple grand for it. I yeah, mean, I've I seen... think you said I overpaid. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 I think you overpaid for what you got, in my okay, opinion. But okay. I've seen testing uh, costs up to, upwards of $10,000. Just so you understand, there's certain tests that you do that are more expensive than others, and they have to pay the lab for each sample. So the larger the home, odds are you're going to have more samples that need to be taken, sent over to the lab, the lab charges for them. So it, it can really range. But in my opinion, it's super important, right? It's like, imagine trying to build a house with no blueprints. You know, there's a reason you pay an architect you know, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 for a set of blueprints. Because now have you have a step-by-step plan of how to build this house properly. When you try to remediate mold, if you have a company that just that's willing to come in and just willy-nilly remediate and, and not have a plan, to me, that would be unethical. Because you don't actually know what it is. At that point, everything is being done on an exploratory basis, which is going to have very little success when you're literally trying to improve somebody's health. So having that plan is, is step one. Once you have the plan, someone like me is going to know if it's a good plan or not. Because if I get a two-page report from somebody, odds are I'm going to be like, "This isn't. I'm not. I'm not getting involved in this." And is the plan what they call the protocol? Yes. So you do inspection. Then whoever does the inspection, if you decide to move forward, you pay a little more money, and they give you a protocol. Then a remediation company fulfills the protocol. Oh is yes. That, is That's, that the gist of it? Yeah. And that was that was what I was had beef with. The fact that they were going to charge you for the protocol. Yeah. It was like another 700 bucks. I was like, wait a second. What do you mean? That's the whole point of doing the testing. You know, like you right. need the protocol to figure out what the action plan is to, to make it right. actionable and fix it. So that, that was what I was so upset about when you told me about that. But anyways, you get this, you get this protocol. Now someone like me who does the work understands where the mold is and what's going to need to be done to, to really resolve it. Um, there, the, just because you have a protocol doesn't mean that you have the expertise or knowledge to f- follow the protocol properly. Yeah. If you hand me a protocol, I'm, I want to know what to do. <laughs> it seems like a very elementary, especially if you've done remediation before, because you're going to be like, yeah, we put up some plastic. We have this machine, right? You know what's interesting? A lot of guys that do remediation don't even know how to use air scrubbers properly, which air scrubbers... If you've ever seen remediation done, typically they're blue. They don't always have to be blue, but they're these blue machines. And what they do is they draw air in. There's typically a pre-filter and a HEPA filter, and then it exhausts the air back out. What you want to do is you want to draw the air into the filter, which is constantly kind of controlling under negative pressure, making sure that inside that containment, it's not going into other parts of the, of the home. And... I was consulting on this project once. It was like one of these failed remediation projects where the client was like, hey, I feel way worse after remediation. Can you can you check it out? Um, we ended up FaceTiming. I just... Because I was like, I just had a feeling based upon what she was telling me. So could you FaceTime me and kind of show me what's going on around there? She had uh, a machine that was set up outside the containment. Okay. And that was, I guess, just to circulate the air or clean the air. It was under neutral pressure. So, so there was no exhausting outside. And it was just, I guess the, their theory was to just recirculate the air and clean the air outside the containment. They were, in theory, trying to do something nice to the, for the client. They had that set up to the max, okay? The, they had another machine inside the containment. Containment basically meaning like a, a sheet of six millimeter plastic that's erected to create a, a, a microclimate inside the room where you're remediating and removing that the mold there. The machine that was set inside was set halfway. So let's talk about building pressure for a second. So the, that one machine was set halfway, so it's about half pressure. And the machine outside the containment was at full pressure. So that is sucking more air outside the containment than, the, than this negatively inside the containment. So what's happening is, as they're remediating, the machine outside is literally pulling mold from inside the containment through interstitial cavities because they have the ceiling open. So it's basically just pulling the mold through the ceiling and, and bringing it outside the containment towards the rest of the house. 
So what was the point of the containment? What was the point of the engineer controls if they're not set up properly? So you have to have that expertise to make sure you know exactly what you're doing. Wow. Or you just, you, in, it looks good to the person that was there. And I was like, miss, you're not feeling well because they're literally pulling mold into the space that you're in that they're not supposed to be doing. And she goes, oh my God, what do I do? I was like, you need to call them right away and tell them to turn the one outside halfway and the one inside all the way up. Wow. Yeah. And so let's say your remediation goes sideways like that because somebody Fs up. Or is it just worse than it ever was now? Because now you got spores all over your damn house instead of just under the kitchen sink? To be careful in answering this question, odds are that the environment did already have contamination. But yes, now it would be much worse because now they're drawing more of that into the environment. So now what they would have to do to fix that would be to aggressively clean the space outside the contained area to remove the contamination that didn't need to be there in the first place. Right. So, and, how, and how is, uh, say that, you know, you go under my kitchen sink with the sledgehammer right now and just get millions of spores all over this house, but you get it all out of the kitchen sink area. How do you clean it provided there's no furniture and belongings, but how would you clean it just off the walls and in the vents and on the floor and everywhere that those spores got? So you're going to use a HEPA vacuum first to just get rid of the debris because it's going to have a lot of dust and debris. Mold spores are going to bind with that dust and debris. So you want to generally clean up the major dust and debris first with a HEPA vacuum. Uh, You want to vent that vacuum outside like you would the scrubber, again, to create that vacuum under negative pressure in case you have smaller particles that are going to pass right through the filter. The HEPA vacuum, it's important to have a true HEPA vacuum. Don't buy a $50 vacuum at Home Depot and put a HEPA filter in there and think you have a HEPA vacuum. That is not the case. (laughs) Okay. It's HEPA ratings, ratings mean that they're well sealed right? And on top of having a filtration that traps smaller particles, that seal is very important because otherwise, as you're vacuuming, it's just getting back into the environment. Right. So you want to HEPA vacuum all the services. And then we use microfiber towels for this next part. Reason being is because any study done on microfiber towels says they're 100 times more effective than any other towel. And we're going to use a, a botanical disinfectant, apply it to the surfaces of the home to help literally separate mold spores, mycotoxins, et cetera, from the surfaces into the microfiber towel, throwing the towel away. And so what you guys do is once someone like with your company, what's the name of your company again? All American Restoration. All American Restoration. So what you guys do then is just the cleanup once someone has an inspection and a protocol. You get that protocol and go, this makes sense. And then you bring your people in and they come do this stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, and we, we travel pretty much all over the country. And so we're just all over the place wherever we go, wherever we're needed, where someone is really not doing well and needs, a, you know, someone that has a little bit more expertise than the other 50,000 companies out there. And what do your workers have to wear? Are these, are these people in hazmat suits? Or, oh yeah. I mean, I'm assuming this is a dangerous ass job. Yeah, if you're going in and basically taking poison out of people's houses, what what are, what kind of stuff are they wearing? Do they have to like go into a little room and get sprayed down afterward and stuff, or what? <laughs> you ever see the movie Outbreak? They look exactly yeah. like that. Actually. Really? Well, yeah. So we just recently bought every all every one of our guys PAPRs. PAPRs are like those hooded helmets. They look yeah. like spacesuits. Um, the reason being is because when when people start growing facial hair, they're not on top of their facial hair when they get like, usually you have to shave your beard, get a fit test. And it's got to have that, that suction to really make sure that it's tight against your skin. So instead of having quality control on, Hey, did you shave your beard today? Or is there a stubble? You can't come to work today. We decided we're just going to go to PAPRs so that these guys can live their lives and, you know, not have to worry about uh, crap that I forget my razor on this trip and running around worrying about that. Now they have a, a, a full PAPR. Also with mycotoxins, again, mycotoxins is such, a, it's such an interesting topic, but we're, we don't really know if they can get through the filter because the filter is really made for particulate. And technically, mycotoxins are really not a particulate. They could be more of an organic vapor. It's really like a chemical residue. Oh, and wow. And so we're concerned about that too. Interesting. So we're like, PAPR is the best option to, to make sure that we're our staff is well protected. So they literally wear these hooded suits now. And then underneath that, you have basically full on Tyvek. 
I mean, it looks like you ever see like a cop show where people are cleaning up bodies afterwards. I mean, that's what these guys look like when they enter, you know, the, they start working and, and really uh, exposing themselves to this. Is this a common practice for other people to do remediation? Does everyone go that hardcore or are they just showing up in overalls and a little cheesy mask? I mean, so I've, I've seen people like not even wearing suits and like just have like the paper mask and it's like, whoa, not the right stuff to wear. Wow. Damn. So, so you should be, but. So you're sealing off the area. You got this HVAC that's sucking everything out of the air. People are in a hazmat type suit. Then once it's all out of the home, you're pretty much good to go as long as you really are mindful about leaks and humidity levels. Sure. Yeah. So after you would post test and make sure that it's fully gone. I mean, we're really good, but we can't see microscopic particles. Mm -hmm. So you still need to test and make sure that it's fully gone so that you don't have this environment where, you know, it's easy to grow. You also have to connect, correct the water intrusion or the opportunity that allowed mold to grow and colonize in the first place. So if your roof leaked, you know, you should repair your roof before you call me because, you know, I can't do anything unless your roof is fixed. You know, things like that. You always want to make sure when we're, you know, we do a lot of crawl spaces, basements, attics, where we're looking for issues where water is getting in, whether it's too much humidity, whether it's just moisture coming in through hydrostatic pressure. Um, we're actually going in, figuring out what's going on and correcting those issues as part of the overall remediation. So sometimes people are, you know, if people are looking like comparatively from our company to another company, their first instinct might be like, well, this, this company is more expensive, you know, but like we've had clients that have seen the difference. Like if they actually read the scopes of work and side by side, they're like, oh, wait, you, you're doing all of that for this? Yes. Oh, that makes sense. You know, so it's, you gotta, you gotta realize, I mean, like if you just do one of those three things that I touched on earlier, which is correct the water intrusion, um, remove the source and then clean up the contamination. If you only do one of those things, you haven't solved the full problem and you're still going to have an, you know, an environment that's going to impact your health. So it's important. You got to do all three of those things. And most remediation companies, like if you go and take your three-day mold class or in Texas, I think it's five days, which is amazing, at least two more days. You're not going to learn everything in, in three to five days, obviously. But when you're sitting there, they only tell you like, yeah, you know, build these tents and put these machines in and remove the drywall and you know, spray it with biocide. They're not, good. They're not really touching on all those three things. And I think the whole industry is so far behind where it needs to be that, I mean, it still shocks me every day. It's like, how am I one of the voices of reason here? You know, Just a, a guy who grew up in construction his whole life um, and have literally seen the same things that our entire society has has been like turning on this light bulb saying we need to change. How did you get into this game anyway? So since I'm pretty much five years old, my dad's been a general contractor. Oh, interesting. Specifically, oh, that's why you... I was like, damn, this guy has good ideas. And we did the walkthrough today. You're like, well, you could take that wall out and do this <laughs> beam. I was like, how does this dude know this, man? I guess mold goes everywhere. gets everywhere. That's how he knows. <laughs> I mean, I've taken apart and put back together so many different buildings, so many different you know structures. It's just like kind of second nature to me now. I mean, I, I I think I told you, I I actually, I've never bought a real house that wasn't a foreclosure that I didn't fix myself just because I know it's like, I'm, I know I'm going to have to remediate anyway. I might as well get it bottom of the market, right? And, and fix it up myself. And then, you know, part of that experience, I've been designing my own houses, um, you know, with just like putting things together. So I started getting like that Martha Stewart eye with it as well. And so on top of the mold and, and, and the construction background that I gained from being around my dad my entire life, um, it just really makes me a well-rounded construction guy. And then what about the book? Tell us about the mold medic and then we'll get out of here. Yes. So I wrote the mold medic because you know it was one of those things where I'm like, am I going to solve this problem one house at a time? Or am I going to solve this problem getting the information out there? And so I started realizing I needed the book. Uh, I needed to get that information out into other people's hands so that when you're reading the book, it's kind of like this awakening. Like, oh my God, yeah, what, duh. Yeah, why, why haven't I been thinking about this all along? And the, the key, the idea is like, there's 50,000 restoration companies out there. I can't be the only one doing things the right way. You know, I need other people to kind of wake up and start doing things the right way as well. Um, and, and that's when I, when I started really going down that path of, I need to educate. I need to start creating my own licensing, you know, certification process to really teach other businesses how to do this. 
Um, and then, you know, if I can solve the problem and not have to do what I do for a living anymore, but help solve the problem, I think I would be just over the moon excited to be able to accomplish that. And then I can focus on what's the next problem. Maybe, maybe we tackle the EMFs together. You oh know, my that's God, the please. next problem. Seriously. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm 50% in luck here because this house has great low EMF, but it has the mold. <laughs> yeah. But imagine, dude, like these conversations don't happen, right? And someone moves into a house or apartment that is high EMF and high mold. I mean, you're screwed, especially if you're a sensitive type like myself and kind of a canary in a coal mine. I mean, a lot of people, they don't seem to be bothered by any of this stuff really, but um, most people that I know that are pretty in tune with their body notice changes like that. And I think so many people out there are probably sick from one of those two things and just have no idea. Oh, yeah. they're, they're working out, they're eating organic, they're doing all the right things and they just cannot get well. Yeah, It's crazy. So thank you for your commitment to the work and for doing it right. And thank you for giving me some tips today with yeah, my contractor yeah. and making sure they don't not only poison me and the fam here, but their workers, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Totally. So I'm like, I don't want, I, A, <laughs> I don't want someone to come in and do mold remediation wrong because I, I don't want my house screwed up, but I totally. also don't want workers getting sick either. So 100%. And, yeah, yeah, I appreciate your, um, your time and energy and expertise and commitment to getting this message out in the way that you are, man. It's very cool. It's kind of a, a a bit of a niche topic, which I think is why I haven't covered it. And I was waiting on someone that could really break it down in a um, easy to digest way. So thank you for being that guy. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. And yeah, yeah. you know, definitely, as you see, it's a much needed message to get out there. Yeah, for real, for real. Um, what's the last thing? Um, the, maybe I have mold exposure, I had brain fog. <laughs> uh, the last thing is I want your recommendations for three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life in any way you want. Three teachers or teachings that have influenced my life. That's a really good question. And no one's ever asked me that. Wow. Well, I'd say definitely my dad. You know, I, I think without my dad, I mean, I wouldn't be here and not just because of, you know, that, that whole thing, but um, just being around construction my entire life. I mean, there's no way that I would have the knowledge that I have today. So he's definitely teacher number one. Um, teacher number two, hmm. Oh, there was this woman, uh, her name is Dr. Ferguson in high school. She didn't really think I would really ever amount to anything. And so I think, just wanted to say thank you to her. <laughs> I, every teacher I ever had. You know, I was, I was, I was a big class it. clown in high school. And so yeah. like, I think, you know, kind of just when I finally was ready to grow up, um, you know, I, I always had that plant, that seed plant in the back of my mind. Um, and, and it definitely made me realize that, you know, whatever I do in this world, I want to do good and help others. And, and you know, this, it just kind of fell into this niche and pathway. And that was pretty cool. And um, let's see, the last third teaching is um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the book. Amazing. I mean, like really opened my eyes to, you know, finances and, um, you know, I think I may not have a company today if I had not read that book. Same here, actually. It really put yeah. things into perspective of how to, you know, really get assets and on the balance sheet. I mean, we've grown tremendously in size year over year since we started. And, um, you know, having to manage money going in and out was, was a really crucial uh, experience that I've uh, had to learn through. And I think reading that book, believe it or not, is uh really been helped shape. Yeah, Robert Kiyosaki. I forgot about yeah. that book. And yeah. I don't think anyone else has ever mentioned that. Sometimes there's repeats, you know, there's yeah. there's the yeah. odd Jesus and, you know, yeah. a spiritual Eckhart Tolle or something like that, you know, but I think you're the first Kiyosaki. So congratulations. That's cool. um, one thing I did want to ask you though, normally I cut it right there, but I just had a thought that might benefit people. Would you have any recommendations for people that are dealing with mold related illness in terms of some of the great authors, thought leaders, doctors, you know, if someone's like, okay, I fixed my house or I moved out of the house, but now I'm sick from mold. Like what, where could they go to find someone really <laughs> badass to actually fix their health? There's, there's a lot of really good doctors out there in all different parts of the country. I think it, it depends where they live. I, I love Instagram these days. Like Instagram seems to be the platform where, a lot of mold aware doctors are are really growing a, an organic following where they're really posting really amazing tips every day about 
how to detox, what to eat, all these lifestyle changes that are going to help improve. Um, there's uh, Dr. Jess, Dr. Tanya Dempsey, uh, Dr. Jill Krista is really good. And her book, Breaking the Mold, is an amazing book. Oh, cool. Um, Dr. Richie Shoemaker is, is uh, you know, kind of, I think they call him the mold god or something like that because he was one of the first, you know, functional medicine doctors to really kind of mainstream, get into the mainstream on this. Um, Dr. Tanya Dempsey, if I haven't mentioned her already, is an amazing you doctor did. in the Northeast. You know, there's, I mean, there's so many to, to name all of them, but oh, those are the good. few that come up. That's, that's great. I didn't, yeah. even, I thought you'd maybe throw out too. So that's good. <laughs> and we put all this stuff in the show notes. So people awesome. listening can actually on the app, just go down and click on these books and totally and doctors. Cause I, I always want to leave people with a, a sense of hope and not just like, oh my God, I bet my house is killing me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Which yeah. it might be, but now we know how to fix it. And we know how to find some great experts to get the body back on track for those that have been negatively affected. So thank you so much. And then lastly, uh, where can we follow you on social media, websites and all that stuff? All right. So to check out my book, go to themoldmedic.com. Um, if you are interested in the service-based company for mold remediation, um, our website is allamericanrestoration.com. To follow me on Twitter or Instagram, it would be at the mold medic. Cool. Mold medic's a good name, by the way. Congrats oh, on getting that URL. That was a score. I know <laughs> how hard it is. When you think of a good name, you're like, ah, oh, it's always taken. Oh, yeah. And I had to pay like a premium for Oh, that. you did? Yes. Yeah, so oh, damn. Someone already thought of that and bought it and was sitting on it, but oh, I had it was that, worth it. I had that happen a few yeah. years ago myself. I had to pay quite a bit of coin to wrestle the, uh, yeah. the URL I wanted from a squatter's greedy little hands. Uh, well, thanks, brother. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for coming to Texas. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Let's go out and get some barbecue and have some fun. Let's do it. Thanks, man. All right, take care. Mm-hmm. 